Whoops, okay. Let me, let me start over again. All right, start, okay. Okay, I'll start over. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about the dynamics of the one-dimensional Ising model. And as I wrote this morning, the uh, flip rate of the one-dimensional Ising model is given by this quantity. Uh, so this is the correct form for one dimension. And in general dimension, this is equal to one-half one minus gamma sigma i hyperbolic tanch. I'm sorry, there's no gamma anymore. There's just hyperbolic, it's minus sigma i hyperbolic tanch of beta h i, where h i is the local field. So this is d larger than or equal to 2. Um, and because of the presence of the hyperbolic tanch is what makes the analytic progress uh, or anal analytic studies of the dynamics of the Ising model in higher than two dimensions or higher than one dimension so difficult. But in one dimension, this simple form allows us to make a lot of analytical progress. So let me just remind you a few things that we uh, derived this morning. So first of all, there's equation motion for the mean spin, SI dot. And so uh, when a spin flips, and so this is nothing more than the thermal average is sigma i dot. And so how does this, when, so we, when we write down the, the rate equation for the average spin, so when a spin flips, it changes by minus twice its value. So the change in the spin value is minus 2 sigma i. And the rate at which it flips is w i, and that's 1 over the time. And so we have this simple dynamical equation for the evolution of the spin. And uh, when we uh, work this out, you know, using uh, this form of the flip rate, we end up with a very simple equation. Uh, so, okay, let me just maybe go through it again. So minus 2 sigma i, well... The one half cancels the two here, so let me not bother with that. And then I have minus sigma i from the f first term. And then I have sigma i times w. And so sigma i times sigma i gives me a one. And so I'm going to get minus gamma over two. And then I just have uh, sigma i minus one uh, plus sigma i plus one, thermal average. And so what we end up with then is minus si and by this is plus sign, plus gamma over 2 si minus 1 plus si plus 1. And so this kind of looks like the diffusion equation, and it kind of is the diffusion equation in disguise, and we were able to write down the solution um, already in one dimension. So uh, for the case where si at t equals 0 is equal to delta i 0, um, S i of t was equal to i sub i of uh, 2 gamma t e to the minus 2 gamma t. And uh, this has asymptotic behavior. So S i of t asymptotically scales as e to the minus, whoops, I have something, my memory isn't quite right here, sorry. It's, this is e to the minus gamma t. And, yeah, it's just gamma, not two, no two. So anyways, the asymptotic behavior, this is one minus gamma t for the temperature positive, and it scales as one over two pi gamma t for the temperature equal to zero. So, as I mentioned this morning, it's like you get nothing because you just say that if you start with one spin plus and everybody else, you, you say the average spin is zero, then this average spin relaxes away. And this is actually more dramatically shown by looking at the behavior of the magnetization. So let's look at m dot. So m dot is going to be the summation over all sites i, s i dot divided by n. And also, just, uh, yeah, so if we do that, um, then what we're going to have here, so when I sum up over all sites, so here I'll get minus magnetization. Here I'm going to get minus magnetization over 2, another magnetization over 2. And so what I'm going to get here is um, magnetization minus 1 minus gamma. Because I have a minus 1 from this term, I have a gamma over 2 from that term, a gamma over 2 from that term. So this is what I get. So the magnetization just decays away to zero. And so the answer here is that uh, M of T, 
uh, scales as e to the minus 1 minus gamma of t for positive temperature, and it's equal to constant. So let me put an uh, exclamation point here for t equals 0. So you see that when t is equal to 0, gamma is equal to 1, so we get m dot equals 0. Magnetization is conserved. And so in some sense, we're learning almost nothing about the behavior of the system by focusing on uh, the average magnetization, I mean, the, the average spin or, or, or the average magnetization. So it turns out that if we want to get a more detailed and deep understanding of the dynamics of the system, it's necessary to look at the two-spin correlation function. And the point is that this two-spin correlation function is the natural way of trying to probe the microscopic behavior of the system. So let us now focus on the two-spin correlation function. And uh, the way it's normally defined is the following. So I define G I J that's equal to the thermal average of S I S J. And so um, this is the natural way of trying to um, characterize a system uh, because it's telling you if I have two spins that are some distance apart, are they correlated or are they not correlated? If they are correlated in some way, then we expect there's some amount of ferromagnetic order that is propagated through the system. But if this thermal average is close to zero, then it means that if I'm a spin up and somebody at the back of the room or someone on the fourth floor here is also, uh, the probability that you're going to be spin up is uncorrelated with me, then that means that somehow ferromagnetic order hasn't transmitted through the system. So this is what we want to focus on, is the behavior of the two-spin correlation function. Okay, and so if we're dealing with a one, and since we're dealing with a one-dimensional Ising model, so another way I could write this, I could write this as G I, um, I plus K, for example. I look at two spins which are distance k apart. So this is a thermal average of S i, S i plus k. So in some sense, there's only, a one, there's only one index here, k. So the thing is that when I average over all spins, the position of the starting spin is irrelevant, and you just look at two spins that are distance k apart. You look at their correlation, and you, and you sum up over all, spins in the si all pairs in the system, and that's what this correlation function is looking like. Now, it turns out there's one very important correlation function, which is the near neighbor correlation function. So let's look at G i, i plus 1, which is equal to S i, S i plus 1, uh, near neighbor correlation function. And because now the index i is irrelevant, I'm going to define this for everything else that follows as G1, the near neighbor correlation function. And the near neighbor correlation function has a very simple physical interpretation, because uh, what is uh, G1? This is equal to, um, well, it is the, the probability that a spin, that the spins are, or this, uh, times plus one. So, you know, if I do the thermal average, there's only two, there's only two, it's, there's four possibilities. Both spins are up or both spins are down, in which case I will get one for the correlation function. And then I have plus the probability of the spins are misaligned, so up, down, or, or down, up, times minus one. And now here comes a, a geometric interpretation of this correlation function. Wherever there is a pair of misaligned spins, let me define there to be like in a sort of a fictitious particle that, can you guys see this? The blue, does that show up okay? I mean, I, I should have red. Okay, well, no, no one's saying anything, so I'm hoping people... Not exactly. You can't see it, okay. All right, so I'll just do it with white. So if I have two spins which are misaligned, I just say that wherever there is a misaligned pair of spins, there's a fictitious particle that lies between them. Similarly here, a fictitious particle between these two guys. So if I think of these fictitious particles as li living on the lattice, then I can ask, like, what is the density of these particles on the lattice? So the thing is that if the spins are misaligned, that corresponds to 
a particle being there, and so that corresponds to density rho, but with a minus one out in front, this corresponds to no particle between the two spins, so that's with density, that happens with probability one minus rho with a plus one. And so we can think of G1 is related to the density of domain walls by this very simple equation. So if the dimensity, if, if there's domain walls everywhere, I mean, if there's no domain walls, then the, then the correlation function is one, which means all the spins are perfectly aligned, whereas that if there's domain walls everywhere, rho is equal to one, then the correlation function is minus one, which means that every single spin is perfectly correlated. It's or oppositely oriented to its nearest neighbor. So this connection between domain wall density, so rho is domain wall density. Or another way I can write rho is equal to one minus g1 divided by two. So these two equations turn out to be very helpful because you know, it, it provides now a simple geometrical way of thinking of what's happening with correlations. Instead of thinking about the spins, one looks at the elementary excitations, which are the domain walls. And in all kinds of problems in condensed matter physics, it always behooves one to try and identify the elemental excitations because the description of the system is much simpler that way. Like the classic example of that is superconductivity, in which you know you have like a Fermi C, you have your non-interacting electrons, there's this effective electron phonon interaction that gives rise to a weak attraction between electrons, which make Cooper pairs, and the Cooper pairs are the elemental excitations. So if you try and deal with a many-body wave function, you just, there's nothing you can do with it. It's just too complicated. But once you deal with these Cooper pairs, then you can start writing equations of motion for their dynamics and understand superconductivity in a nice way. Similarly here, these domain walls provide a nice geometric way of, of actually characterizing the dynamics of the one-dimensional Ising model. And I'm going to return to that um, momentarily. Um, but now what I want to do is now having introduced the correlation function, I want to pursue the same program as previously, which is let's write down the equation of motion for the two spin correlation function. And what we're going to see, just to preview what's going to happen, is we're going to get almost the same equations for the mean spin, but with one little twist that makes the dynamics actually non-trivial. So let's now look at the equation g i j dot. And so how does this change as a function of time? So again, uh, this is going to be nothing more than the time derivative of sigma i sigma j dot. But now how does, uh, so how can things change? Well, if anyone, if either of these spins changes, then the correlation function changes by twice its value. Just the same way when I change a spin, it changes by minus twice its value. So this is nothing more than minus uh, two um, sigma i sigma j. But now the rate at which uh, this thing can change, so again, the correlation function changes by minus twice its value, and now I have to put in the rate at which it changes, and how can it change either spin i flips or spin j flips? So here I'm gonna have w i plus w j. So that's what we have to compute. So let's do this. And again, it's, it's kind of a pleasant calculation once you're used to playing around with the algebra. So we're going to have sigma i, um, sigma j. And so w i, uh, so it's going to be 1 half, 1 minus gamma over 2, sigma i, sigma i minus 1 plus sigma i plus 1. So that is the flip rate of site at site i. And then I have plus one half, oh, this, we're not closing the bracket yet, plus one half, one minus gamma over two, sigma j, because now it's a flip rate at site j, uh, sigma j minus one plus sigma j plus one. And now we close the square bracket and then we have average value. Okay, so let's, let's play with this. So notice that, f so there's two, there's a term here which involves the ones. So we have one half plus one half, which is one. Uh, and then we have minus two sigma ij, which is just minus two gij. So there's one term here, which is minus two gij. 
And now we have uh, the other terms here. So here I want to take sigma i, sigma j. So sigma i with sigma i gives me 1. And then I have sigma j with sigma i minus 1 plus sigma uh, i plus 1. And so what I'm going to get here is plus, and now there is a 1 half that cancels the 2 here, but now there's a 1 half, so there's plus gamma over 2. And now, again, the sigma i squared is 1. Then I have sigma i minus 1j, sigma i plus 1j. So I'm going to have g i minus 1j plus g i plus 1j. And from the second term, well, I already took care of this, but then here I have more or less the same game. Now the sigma j is annihilated, and then I have sigma i times sigma j minus 1 plus sigma j plus 1. So I'm going to write here g i j minus 1 plus g i j plus 1. Um, final step is I'm going to assume translational invariance. Namely, I expect that... Uh, that the correlation function depends only on the distance between the two spins, but not on the actual location in the system. So translational invariance means that g i j is really just some function of g of i minus j, the absolute value of the difference, and I'll define this thing to be g of n. So n is a distance between site i and site j. And so now the equation for g n dot g n dot is equal to minus 2 g n. But now if we look here, um, this is one distance bigger than before. This is one, uh, uh, I forgot a 1 here, i plus 1 j. So this is, you know, i minus 1 is, the distance between j and i minus 1 is n plus 1. This distance is n minus 1. This distance is n minus 1. This distance is n plus 1. So I get two identical terms here, and so I'm going to get plus gamma g n plus 1 plus g n minus 1. So it's exactly the same equation as for the mean spin except for an overall factor of 2. So you might say, well, I have a, I've got nothing from this, but in fact we do have something from this because this has to be supplemented by a boundary condition. Here the boundary condition is at g0. The self-correlation is necessarily 1 at all times. And that boundary condition is crucial in why the dynamics of the two-spin correlation function is different than that of the average spin, where there was no boundary condition on the equation. And then the only other thing that we need is gn at t equals 0. So this is, we supply it, user supplied. And the conventional case is to imagine looking at an uncorrelated initial system and asking how do correlations develop. Um, as a function of time. Okay, so um, it turns out that the solution to this um, recursion formula with this boundary condition and some, you know, random initial conditions is actually a rather hard problem and I'm not going to solve it. And in fact, now I can tell, again, I wish there was students here to tell a story. Let me tell a story to you students out here which is that there's a very famous paper by Roy Glauber, I think it's 1965, and it's the dynamics of the one-dimensional Ising model. And for people who work in non-equilibrium spin systems, the, everybody talks a Glauber model this, a Glauber model that, Glauber, Glauber, Glauber. And so, you know, he was my hero, because he was just, you know, and the paper is so beautiful. And so, um, you know, our physics department at Boston University hosted a yearly colloquium for Nobel Prize winners and we always have like a fancy dinner afterwards with famous people arriving. And so, you know, we had one of those dinners and I'm dressed up in a suit and I'm looking like a, I'm looking like a, a person rather than like a slob. And so I sit down at the table and this elderly guy sits down beside me and so I said, well, hi, my name's Sid Redner. I, at the time, I guess I was the chairman of the department at the time, so I said, I'm chairman of the department. And he says, hi, my name's Roy Glauber. And I go, Roy Glauber, you're my hero. Oh my God, you know, it's like, can I get your autograph? He says, what's the big deal? He said, well, your paper on the one-dimensional Ising model. Oh, that little thing? Just like some. No. <laughs> this was just some uh, side project for him, but you know, that was just kind of an amusing story. <laughs>
anyways, he was, he was a cool guy. I really enjoyed meeting him. And uh, he, th he thought I was like, you know, I don't know what he thought of me. But I was kind of like, I was like a teenager meeting a, a hero. Or meeting like, I don't know, if I met Beyonce or something like that. Okay, anyways, but now I want to, so the discrete solution is difficult. So what I want to do now is I want to solve this um, uh, in the continuous limit. So let's talk about the continuum solution. And part of the reason of doing the continuum solution, as I'm going to try and imp impress upon you, is that the continuum solution is much simpler than the discrete solution. That's number one. Number two, it contains all the same physics. So why work so hard to, to get the recursion formulas just right when you can just do the continuum solution? So the continuum solution is the following equation. We want to solve the continuous analog of uh, this thing here. And also, uh, again, to make my life simple, and because it's the, most, it's the most interesting case, let's focus the attention on the case of t equals 0, which corresponds to gamma equals, in, uh, equals 1. <clears throat> and so in that case, this thing just becomes exactly the discrete second derivative. And so in the continuous limit, I would just have to solve dg by dt is equal to d second g by dx squared. And then I have to supplement this with the condition that g of 0 t is always equal to 1. And let me choose the initial condition g of x t equals 0 is equal to 0. So now my user supplied initial conditions. I'm starting with an, an initially uncorrelated system. My spins are randomly aligned. Um, and I let the correlations develop. And we know that at zero temperature, the one-dimensional Ising model does exhibit spontaneous magnetization. So if I start with an uncorrelated system, spontaneous magnetization is going to develop. And we want to ask, like, how does it develop? So um, to solve this problem, I'm going to actually solve a different problem, which is almost the same as this one. Let's consider the following quantity, um, Cxt was equal to 1 minus g. And you'll see why I'm going to choose that in just a moment. So if I look at this auxiliary problem, then first of all, because there's only a difference of a constant, this satisfies dc dt is equal to d second c by dx squared. But this is supplemented by the conditions that c of 0 and t is equal to 0. And c of x and t equals 0 is equal to 1. So physically, what I'm arguing is that, well, first of all, these two problems are identical. But physically, the way I can think about this is that this is like a concentration field in one dimension. I start with a concentration equal to 1 for all positive x, an absorbing boundary condition x equals 0. And so, you know, we're just dealing with a problem that I have my semi-infinite line. I have my initial concentration like this. So here is x. Here's the concentration. And whenever particles hit the, the origin, they fall off and die off the cliff. And so this concentration field is gradually going to develop something like this. And we want to understand this time development. And in fact, we know how to solve this problem because uh, I mentioned, I guess, in the first lecture, that if I have a single particle starting at x naught with an absorbing boundary condition at 0, then the solution is a sum of a Gaussian at x naught and an anti-Gaussian at minus x naught. So for a delta function source, we know the solution. So that delta function source is the Green's function for the problem. So for um, uh, uh, c of x t equals 0 is equal to delta of x minus x naught, the solution we already know. And normally I would write g for the Green's function, but I'm using g for the correlation function. So let me call this h the Green's function, which is a function of x, x naught, and t. And so this is equal to 1 over 4 pi dt e to the minus x minus x naught squared over 4 dt. That's the initial Gaussian. And then I have the anti-Gaussian, e to the minus x minus x naught squared over 4 dt. And so now I can compute my concentration. My concentration is nothing more than c. I just have to integrate this integ uh, Green's function, h, x, x naught, t, dx naught. So if I put like 
instead of having a delta function x naught, I just have a uniform concentration or a superposition of delta functions over all x naught with the same weight, then this is my concentration field. And so let's compute it because, again, it's like I get the feeling that students are so quick to go to Mathematica and simulation, and you, you know, you look at this and you, you get lost right away, but this is easily calculable uh, so, uh, analytically. Yeah. To be explicit, there should be C of uh, x and t, x naught and t equals zero in the integral, right? Which is one. Say that again? So the, um, uh, in the integral, there should be C of x naught uh, and uh, t equals zero, no? So you are propagating right. the initial that's, condition that's right. to so time I should, t. I should be integrating the Green's function against the initial condition, which is one. Yeah, so I just kind of assume that. All right, so let's just, let's just go a little, a little bit further here. So there's uh, 1 over 4 pi dt is a common factor out in front. And then I have the integral from 0 to infinity. And I have e to the minus x minus x naught squared over 4 dt uh, minus e to the minus x minus x. By the way, I made a mistake here. This is the Gaussian at x naught. This is the anti-Gaussian that should be centered at minus x naught. So this should be a plus sign here. So this is e to the minus x plus x naught squared over 4 dt. So, and then I want to integrate this thing dx naught. So what I do here is say, well, in the first integral, I'm going to say let, uh, for this integral, I said let y is equal to x minus x naught over the square root of 4 dt. And in the second integral, I'm going to set let y equal to x plus x naught over the square root of 4 dt. So in the first integral, the, it becomes just e to the minus y squared. Uh, the 4 dt is, is already absorbed by this. So there's an overall factor of 1 over root pi. So I have 1 over root pi. And in the first integral, when um, x is equal to 0, this is an integral from minus x naught over 4 dt square root to infinity of e to the minus y squared dy. And in the second integral, I have a minus sign, and I'm going to have the integral, so when x is equal to 0, uh, then this is x naught plus x naught over 4 dt square root to infinity of e to the minus y squared dy. And um, so we have the same integrand, and we're integrating from, from minus x naught to infinity and we're subtracting away x naught to infinity, so the integral itself is just the integral from minus x naught over 4 dt to plus x naught over 4 dt. So this is equal to 1 over root pi, integral from minus x naught over 4 dt to plus x naught over 4 dt square root, e to the minus y squared dy. And this is a basic special function. This is nothing more than error function of x over 4 dt. And so that's the answer for the, um, for c. And um, now if we plot this error function, so, you know, the error function is, is a function, so let me sort of plot it. Uh, so here is the argument z, and here is error function of z. So it starts off linear and it saturates to 1. Uh, and minus 1. So, um, you know, it's a function that looks something like this. So that's the error function. And so from that, we can now infer what we expect to see for um, both the concentration and the, um, and the correlation function. So if I plot now C, as a function of x for different times. So initially, the concentration was just 1. And so if the time is very short, then as x just moves, moves a little infinitesimally, the argument gets very big very quickly. And when the argument gets big, um, you know, the, the, uh, the argument, it, it, you know, we get very quickly into the asymptotic regime. And so at short time, our function looks something like this. And then as time goes on, it's, it's doing something like this and something like this. So that's what C is doing. And so what G is doing is just 1 minus that. So here is G is a function of x. So um, in this case, G starts off 
was zero, and we have a boundary condition one. And so what G is doing is just the one minus this. So it's doing looking like this. And so as time goes on, it's getting flatter and flatter. And there's a characteristic range over which the correlations spread. And this range is growing like square root of t. Oh, by the way, um, yeah, it's just square root of t. So that's the main result that we learned from this, is that even though the magnetization is conserved in the one-dimensional Ising model at zero temperature, if I start with an initially uncorrelated system, correlations spread in such a way, at a rate square root of t, such that spins get more and more correlated, and this goes on forever. So this coarsening process is, is essentially governed by the formation of like domains of correlated spins where the correlation range is growing like square root of t. Now, uh, now that I've solved it analytically, let's try and look more pictorially at what we might expect to see. And so um, let's, now I can erase all of this stuff here. I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, do you mean that correlation range also increases, or just correlation increases, but the correlation range remains like the nearest neighbor? No, no. So again, this is we're looking at the nearest neighbor. Uh, I mean, sorry. This g of x here, g, x is a separation between two spins. So I'm looking at the general correlation function at arbitrary distance, and the point here is that this, you know, like here. This would be the near neighbor correlation at distance one. And so this near neighbor correlation quickly gets larger and larger. If I look out here at, say, a distance 100, the, 100, the correlation between spins a distance 100 apart, it stays close to zero for a longer time, but eventually it also rises to one. And the time that it takes for the 100th neighbor correlation function to rise will go like 100 squared. And if I look at the 1,000 neighbor correlation function, it will also rise eventually. But it's all the range of which a correlation spreads is governed by the square root of t. Does Thank you. Mean? Okay. Okay. So the thing is that now that we've seen what happens algebraically, let me show you pictorially what's going on because it, it provides an additional insight into the problem. So once again, uh, let me be, maybe give a little title that's equivalence uh, to domain wall dynamics. Ah, I erased the flip rate. I needed the flip rate. So let's go back. Let me just write the flip rate again. Wi, which is equal to 1 half, 1 minus uh, uh, sigma i over 2, uh, sigma i minus 1 plus sigma i plus 1. So now I'm talking about the zero temperature limits. I'm not worrying about this factor gamma. And so let's look at what this means for different configurations of spins. So if I have a domain wall. So I have like a domain of plus spins and then there is a domain wall particle and a domain of minus spins. So suppose this spin were to flip. If this spin were to flip, then the configuration afterwards is a bunch of spins up. This spin is now flipped. It's up. This spin is still down. And the domain wall particle has moved to the right. So we can think of uh, as a domain wall moves by plus or minus one, there's nothing more than simple diffusion of a domain wall particle. And equally likely, this domain wall particle can move to the left or to the right. And in fact, if we look at this flip rate, notice that when this spin flips, there's one spin misaligned and one spin aligned. When it flips, it's still in the same environment of one spin aligned or one sp and one spin misaligned. There's no energy change, delta E is equal to zero. And similarly, if you look at the flip rate here, if these two spins are misaligned, you know, the neighbor of this particular spin has one neighbor up, one neighbor down, so the sum of the spins is equal to zero. So I get zero for this guy. I have one with a one half. So the flip rate is equal to one half if I have this configuration of spins. So if I'm trying to flip this guy, well, actually, let me, let me not make it more complicated than I need to. So if I have a spin whose two neighbors are misaligned, then there's no energy cost for flipping it. And according to Glauber dynamics, the flip rate is one half. On the other hand, 
if I have uh, something like this, so now I have two, you know, two misaligned spins in a row. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just want this. So I have one misalign, one spin down in a C of plus. Now what I have is two domain walls which are nearest neighbor to each other. And if the central spin flips, now there's no domain wall. So these two guys have come together and they've annihilated. And notice that when this spin flips, the energy uh, delta E is equal to minus twice J. So uh, there's, whenever you have an energy loss, it corresponds to domain wall particles disappearing. And according to the flip rate of the one-dimensional Ising model, if sigma I minus one and sigma I plus one are opposite in sign to sigma I, so if these are both say plus one, and this is minus one, then the, you know, the sign becomes a plus here. So I have one plus a half times two, and so this is one plus one, so it's two divided by a half. So you get a flip rate of one if you have this environment, plus, minus. And finally, the last case is, well, what happens if it's an energy raising event? So an energy raising event happens if I do exactly the opposite. If I have like a, a, do, a domain of spins, they're all happy because they're all aligned. And somehow, because of thermal agitation, which does not exist at t equals zero, but let's now suppose there's a non-zero temperature. If this spin flips, then I create two domain walls then there's an energy gain of 2J, which it doesn't like doing. But then if I look at the flip rate of the Ising model in one dimension, um, in this case, all that happens is now sigma I is aligned with sigma I minus one and sigma I plus one. And so you're gonna get one half plus two times two. So it's one minus one, so you get zero. So the flip rate is zero for the configuration like this. And so now we can make a simple you know, descriptive mapping between the dynamics of the Ising model and the following reaction scheme of particle plus particle annihilation. So this whole reaction scheme is exactly equivalent to this uh, bimolecular reaction scheme of freely diffusing particles in one dimension because diffusion is free, it doesn't cost any energy. So particles diffuse and whenever two particles meet and at the same site, they just simply annihilate. And so the dynamics of the one-dimensional Ising model is exactly isomorphic to a reaction process of particle-particle annihilation. So uh, one can do a lot with this mapping. And you know, the one thing I have not discussed here because it's more complicated is when you're doing dynamics at finite temperature where there's also pair creation. But now we have a sense of what happens at some small finite temperature, which is that you know, your domain walls diffuse around they annihilate when they meet. Every once in a while, there's pair creation. So there'll be some steady state where the pair creation rate is balanced by the annihilation rate. And so you have like a dilute gas of these uh, domain walls that are diffusing around. But because domain wall density is non-zero, uh, that means that there can't be any spontaneous magnetization because you know, one, needs, you know, one needs everybody to be aligned to have spontaneous magnetization. And in fact, this was the source of Pyrrell's original argument to argue that um, there would be no spontaneous magnetization in above one dimension, because we see that in one dimension at non-zero temperature, there's a finite density of domain walls. And he was trying to develop that for two dimensions to show that there should be also a finite density of domain walls, which would uh, lead to non no magnetization. But that argument turned out to be incorrect. Okay, so um, I guess, that's all I have to say about the one-dimensional Ising model. So it's a natural Questions? Maybe, um, how do you simulate this, um, <laughs> yeah, like this system? What do you mean by how do you simulate? What, what, no, like, which like, system are you talking about? This, the Ising model or the-, or the Yeah, no, no, yeah, the one-dimensional Ising model. Um, the, this dynamics, uh, what is the idea of the simulation? Well, so like the simplest way is that you would just, uh, you know, you put your spins on a one-dimensional line 
And um, first of all, uh, if we're doing, say, a finite temperature simulation, that means that every spin has a non-zero flip rate. So you pick a spin at random, you know its flip rate. So at non-zero temperature, you know, these will involve, you know, things with involving gamma and this will be non-zero, but you just pick a spin at random and with a certain probability proportional to its flip rate, you just flip it and then you just do this over and over again. So that would be a very naive simulation because, you know, every single spin you've got to test and, um, you know, but for finite, finite temperature, that's what you'd have to do. But in general, you know, like the, the message I would say to um, anybody is like, there's no point in simulating an exactly soluble model. You might, as well sol you might as well simulate a model that's not exactly soluble. But if you, if you want to try it just for fun, then that's what you would do. D does that address your question? Yes, yes, thanks. Oh, sure, okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, so what I want to do now in, in the remaining time is uh, actually describe uh, a closely related spin system to the uh, Ising model. It's called the voter model. And for any of you who've worked in social dynamics, maybe you've even heard the terminology, but the voter model is in some sense a fruit fly of interacting particle systems because it's the simplest interacting particle system that we know of. It's exactly soluble in all spatial dimensions and the method of solution is also very simple and very pretty and one gets a lot of useful insight from it. And it's also very closely related to the Ising model itself. And so it's good to, it's a, this is a good time to introduce the voter model and describe the similarities and differences with the Ising model and then to solve the voter model. So the way that the voter model was first, it was first introduced by mathematicians. And you know, uh, I hope there's no mathematicians in the audience here, uh, but you know, we who are physicists like to think, well, the mathematicians, they want to prove the truth and we're only content to know the truth. But on the, and then another aspect about mathematicians is that in general, um, you know, their, their model construction is always like very formal and very rigid. But it turns out that the mathematicians beat us physicists to the punch in the voter model because they invented the voter model. It's a very beautiful model, very simple. And um, then we just sort of hung on their coattails. Anyways, voter model. So the voter model has a very simple descriptive way of presenting it. So let me first tell you the descriptive way and then I'll write some equations. So the way you can think of the voter model is that you have a group of people in the room. So in this room at the moment, we only have three people. I shouldn't reveal, maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Anyways, and uh, we, and we, each of us is endowed with a two-state opinion. We either vote for Trump or we vote for Sanders. That's, and that's all we have. And the rules of the game for the voter model are the following, is that you pick a random voter. I pick me. I'm a random voter. I pick another random voter. I won't identify who the other people in the room are, so you can't get in trouble with the Italian government. And I ask, who are you going to vote for in the election? And you say, I'm going to vote for Trump. And I think, wow, that's a great idea. I'm going to vote for Trump, too. And you repeat this update process over and over again until in a finite system necessarily you reach consensus. And then the question you might ask is how long does it take to reach consensus? And given some initial condition, how, you know, what is the probability of reaching Trump consensus versus Sanders consensus <coughs> as a function of the number of initial voters of each type? <coughs> so that's the dynamics of the voter model. So you see just by its description, it smells a little bit like the Ising model, but it's not quite the Ising model, and I'll, I'll tell you why it's not quite in, uh, right now. So for the voter model, to understand its dynamics, we have to write down the flip rate. So what is the rate at which a voter changes opinion? By the way, in going back to like this sort of opinion dynamics type of model, in this description where I ask someone else, like who you vote for, and I just adopt their state, that means I have zero self-confidence. So it's a population of lemmings who have no self-confidence and only adopt the state of their neighbor. And so if I want to make this formal, the rules of the voter model is you pick a voter at random, it picks a random neighbor, it adopts its state, you repeat this over and over again, and in a finite system you'll necessarily reach consensus. So with that description, let's now write down what is the flip rate of a given spin. And so this is equal to one half 
Uh, so let me write it down and then let me justify it. 1 minus sigma i divided by z, summation sigma j, j uh, neighbors of i. Here z is the coordination number of your lattice. So, uh, so I'm assuming now that my voters are living on the sites of a regular lattice. It doesn't have to be that way, but for simplicity, let's just do it. Sites in a regular lattice, so it looks something like the Ising model in the sense that it spins on a lattice or voters on a lattice. And uh, let's just verify that this works. So if everybody agree, if I'm in a neighborhood, uh, if I'm in Trump land and, every, and I am a Trump voter, so, so call, suppose I'm a Trump voter that corresponds to sigma i equals plus one, but all my neighbors are also plus one and I have z nearest neighbor, so this guy is going to be plus one, z plus z, I divide by z, so I get plus one, and if I'm a, a Trump voter, I'm also plus one, I get one minus one, I get zero. So if I'm in agreement with all my neighbors, I don't flip. On the other hand, if I'm in a sea of Sanders voters and I'm a Trump voter, and if I call Sanders minus one, then I'll have minus z for this guy, and I divide by z, so I get minus one, that conspires with this guy to give me plus one, and I have a flip rate of one. And in general, you can convince yourself that this flip rule is, is the same as proportional rule. So um, it's proportional to the fraction of neighbors that disagree with you. Let, let me just do one more case just to convince you of this. So suppose that my um, environment is... Uh, for example, plus, minus, 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 well, let me do it this way, plus, plus, plus. So in the Ising model, as I mentioned this morning, the Ising model zero temperature is majority rule. If I'm a plus spin here, I stay plus. I can't change my state. But according to uh, this rule here, so, uh, you know, the flip rate for this spin, so it's going to be one half, so W of I is equal to one half, and uh, so it's 1 minus, so this is plus 1, 1 over 4, because there's 4 neighbors. And then I have 1, 2, 3, minus 1, so it's 2. And so that's 1 half is equal to 1 fourth. And 1 fourth is the fraction of neighbors that are in the minus state. And you can convince yourself just by working through the other possibilities. So the flip rate of this guy is 1 fourth. The flip rate of this would be one half. The flip rate of, uh, of this guy would be three quarters. And the flip rate of this guy would be equal to one. And so it's just proportional to the number of disagreeing neighbors. And another feature about this is that there's no, you know, the, the sum of the spins is not inside of some hyperbolic tanch or something like that. And that's why the algebra of these sigma operators works f for you to actually compute everything that you'd want to do. Okay, so let's now use this to uh, compute the average spin and the average correlation function just as we did for the one-dimensional Ising model. So the steps are all very much the same, and so I may speed up a little bit here, but let's just start. So let's now compute SI dot, which is the thermal average of sigma I dot. So I'm going to compute this. So this is minus twice sigma i w i. Again, this is our basic equation of motion that if a spin flips, it changes my, by minus twice its value and the rate at which it flips is w sub i and so this gives me, the, here's my rate equation. And so what is this? So again, the two and the one half cancels. The first term here is just minus s i and then I'm going to have plus and so the sigma i kills this guy, and I'm going to get plus 1 over z. And then I'm going to have summation uh, si, sj, j and neighbor to i. So that's what si dot is. And like the natural thing to look at is the magnetization, because that's sort of this, the basic one body uh, function. So we look at m dot, which is the summation si summed over all i divided by n. So here we get minus 1 magnetization, 
Here we have Z neighbors, so we have Z magnetizations divided by Z, so we're going to get magnetization, minus magnetization plus magnetization, zero. So it's the SI dot, right? The mm -hmm. Where SI dot divided by N, down. Oh, yeah. dot, thank you. Thanks for keeping me honest. Okay, so um, again, it's just as in the one-dimensional Ising model, um, we get nothing. So let's look now at the correlation function. And hopefully it's not going to come as a surprise that the correlation function is going to satisfy the same equation as the uh, uh, correlation function, the one-dimensional Ising model. The new feature here is that because it's proportional rule rather than majority rule, that diffusion-like equation that held in one dimension actually holds in all dimensions. And so that's what makes the uh, voter model so much simpler because it's basically solving the diffusion equation in arbitrary dimensions. So now let's look at um, g i j, which is equal to sigma i sigma j. And I want to compute the time derivative of this thing. So time derivative of that. So this is equal to minus 2 sigma i sigma j w i plus w j. And then I do exactly the same you know, rigmarole as before. So there's a minus 2. Um, but the flip rate has an a half in it. So let me now cancel that out right from the very beginning. So I have minus sigma i sigma j. And then I have uh, 1 minus sigma i over z summation sigma j. And it, let's hopefully trust me that it's uh, nearest neighbor Maybe to the That yep. should be sigma k, right? It's not the same j as oh, outside. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, this is a summation of neighbors, so let's call this summation k. Thank you. I, I would have eventually found it, but good to find it earlier than later. And then I have plus, and I have, uh, so that's w sub i, and then I have plus w sub j, so 1 plus sigma j over z, summation over k again, but that k is not the same as this k. It's just a dummy index that I'm summing over uh, sigma k. So, you know, when you start... Look, I mean, and we're also doing this in arbitrary spatial dimensions. But, like, to make life simpler, let's just live on the square lattice because it will be easier to try and figure out what's happening here. So if we're doing this on the square lattice, for the first term, we have sigma i squared, so that's 1. And then we have sigma j um, with, uh, uh, you know, with the sum summation over nearest neighbors. So, in fact, to keep my indices a little bit more clear, let's just go to g x, y dot. So now, um, I'm sorry, no, the, the, that ain't going to work. Um, so let's see what I want to say here. So maybe it's better to like do a picture. Yeah, that, that'll make it more clear. So we have site i, and we have a site j. And when I look at this correlation function, so k are the neighbors of i. So the neighbors of i are, are this site, this site, this site, and that site. So when I have the correlation function, it's like I, I start with the correlation function ij, and now I have the correlation function of the four neighbors of site i. And similarly, for this term, I'm going to have, again, my ij, but I'm just looking at the four neighbors of site j. So here is i, here is j. And so basically the point is that you know, if this is a, a certain distance apart, then the distance to the north guy is the same as the distance of this one from the south guy. So it's, the point is that the two different sets of terms for a translation invariant system are the same, you know, the same distances away from each other. And so it turns out that if you then, so when I say that this contribution is the same as this contribution, and then I have... Um, so now I'm going to write it this way. It's just more clean, which is g at coordinate x, y, t, dg by dt. And that's going to be just nothing more than um, g. Uh, well, so there's the, the term out in front. So there's a minus g, x, y. And then there's plus. And so let me just write it out. Um, x plus 1, y, t plus g of x minus 1 y t plus g of x y plus 1 t plus g of x y minus 1 t. 
And, you know, again, it's like it's easier to write it down and convince yourself of it than to me to say more words to try and, and uh, do more with it. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, you should have a factor of two in the first yes, term, yes. the minus G. Thank you. There's a factor of two here because there, uh, was, there was these terms and these terms. No, no, uh, in the GXY term, no? So in the uh, in the first me, let, term, let me, let me just check. This. So if you if you take the equation above, then there are two terms one. No? Yeah, just just bear bear with me a second. So yeah, so let's going back to here. Yeah, so there's two. Yes, there's two terms with a one. So this is two. Thank you. Yes. And and, uh, and then yeah. uh, there is no factor two there. And there's no factor two here. And uh, here you have uh, one dimension, essentially, right? What do you mean one dimension? That is for uh, one dimension. This is for two dimensions, because I have two arguments. I have the x and y coordinates. So, see, because I, I drew this in two spatial dimensions. So, ah, okay, so you are taking x and y as the difference between the, uh, so the, the... So, no, I'm using now x and y as the absolute, you know, so, uh, yeah, I see, I see what your concern is, and so I'm... I'm how do I fix this? Because it's like it's so. If if uh, x uh, is a uh, coordinate of uh, x coordinate of i minus x coordinate of j, right? Then I think it's okay. Okay, all right. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for saving me. Yes. So that's that's a good point. That um, so again, here is site i and here is site j, and so this I'm calling x and this I'm calling y. The difference between the x coordinate is x and the difference between the y coordinate is that. And yes, and then everything works out. All I'm doing is just shifting the x and y coordinates by plus or minus one. Okay, so um, yeah, sorry that that wasn't quite kosher what I did, but now the end result is we get a very simple equation for the correlation um, function. Sorry, yeah. uh, then I think you need the factor two. <laughs> <laughs> because as you were saying, both terms uh, are giving you Okay. The same, uh, the same. Yeah. So that's same why thing. I was trying to say that these terms are the same exactly. as those terms. Exactly. So yeah. I'm going to put the two yeah. back here. Okay. Very good. And so, but now we take the continuous limit. So let's look at the continuous limit. So in the continuous limit, if I just had a one here, then I'd have. Uh, you know, that uh, the time derivative is equal to, so let, yeah, so if there was just, no, I, that's fine. So in the continuous limit, uh, it's saying that, you know, this is the, this is sort of the average, this is G, you know, aver, you know summed over its nearest neighbor minus G at a given point. This is just nothing more than the, the, the Laplace operator, the discrete version of the Laplace operator. That's Sorry the, again. You don't, don't be sorry. It's better you tell me something. Uh, else. You missed the factor one over z. One over z. In the second terms. Oh, you gavalt. Uh, so in the, in the second terms. So, but the thing is that no, but the thing is that you know when I do the summation over all neighbors, there are four neighbors. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. So I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't lose too much. I lost something. Okay. Continuum limit. So in the continuum limit, I hope it's not a surprise that what this translates to is nothing more than g d d t is equal to Laplacian of g. And so what I want to spend the rest of this lecture, oh, oh it's only 3.30. What I want to spend the rest of this lecture doing is solving this uh, for this geometry of the voter model because it's one of these things where um, if you, if you can, do th you can do very powerful things in very easy ways with the right approximations. So we want to solve this equation, but again, we have the same boundary conditions, which is that g of 0 and t should be equal to 1. That is, you're self-correlated with yourself. But now there's actually a little bit of a, a subtlety associated here because this is true for one spatial dimension. But in higher spatial dimension, the appropriate boundary condition is g of a t is equal to 1. So this is true for d larger than 1, where a is some number which is strictly positive but very, very small. So the point here is that 
clearly you are, you know, if you have discrete spins, you're perfectly correlated with yourself. But as you're going to see, if you want to think about the continuous limit, basically we're solving the diffusion equations, those random walks, and we're going to see that in two dimensions, a random walk can never hit a point. It can only hit a finite size sphere. So we need a lower cutoff, a lower size for this lower cutoff here, a non-zero size in order that we have a well-defined boundary condition. And this will be clear both mathematically and physically as I go along. And then the last point in all of this is that I need to have G at, at you know, position R now, at some T equals zero, is user-defined. And so normally I'm going to take uncorrelated because that's the simplest case to deal with, which means it's equal to zero. So initially there's no correlations in the system. I'm perfectly self-correlated with myself. I, I evolve by the diffusion equation, and we want to figure out what is the long-time behavior. And it turns out that there's very different behavior in one dimension, two dimensions, and higher than two dimensions. And the difference in, in solutions as a function of dimension is generic for many kinds of many-body problems in physics, and it's important, and that's why I'm spending so much time in this example, because we're going to see lots, we'll get a lot of general insights just by beating this particular example to death. So, let's first of all solve for the correlation function. Um, so, we can do it in general spatial dimensions larger than two, but let me just do the case of, oh yeah, let me do the case of uh, larger than two dimensions. And in fact, I'm not going to solve this problem because it doesn't lend itself to a nice geometric interpretation, but I'm going to solve the cousin of this problem, which is I'm going to solve, I'm going to instead go to uh, C, which is equal to 1 minus G. And then the equation that C solves is CT is equal to Laplacian of C, uh, with C of 0 T is equal to 0. So we start with, an, that's the absorbing boundary condition in G in, in one dimension, or C of A T equals zero for d larger than one, so this is d equals one, and we start with every, you know, sort of a unit concentration, so c at x t equals zero is equal to one. That turns out just to be easier to think about. So let's now solve this for d larger than two. So we were solving dc dt is equal to Laplacian, so that's d second c by the r squared plus d minus 1 over r, dc by dr, um, that's, and, you know, we're dealing with like a, uh, you know, this is a, a spherically symmetric problem, so we don't have to worry about angular variables. So now let me tell you a fact that at the end of this lecture, or maybe the beginning of the next lecture, you'll believe, but let me just tell you a fact, which is that in the long, this, there's a time-dependent solution here, but this time-dependent solution converges to an equilibrium static solution. And so, I'm just going to set this equal to zero. Just forget this guy. And now we have an equidimensional equation, and so that means that the solution is in the form C of R is equal to R to the alpha. We plug it into the equation, and we're going to get uh, what you call it, a conditional equation characteristic. Yeah, additional equation. So you get alpha, alpha minus one. So when I, when I differentiate twice, I'll get R to the alpha minus 2 times coefficient alpha times alpha minus 1, but the power of r is common everywhere, so I'm not going to write it. d minus 1 alpha is equal to 0. So that tells us that our solutions have alpha is equal to 0, or alpha is equal to 2 minus d. So it tells us that c of r, the equilibrium solution is, is a plus b divided by r to the d minus 2. And now we want to impose the boundary conditions. So um, at C of A is equal to zero. So that gives me that um, A plus B over A to the D minus two is equal to zero. So that says that um, A is equal to minus B over A to the D minus two. And so, what? What's equal to one? C of A. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Okay, so, uh, so what we're going to get then is some B, um, uh, 1 over R to the D minus 2 minus 1 over A to the D minus 2. 
Um, and then the other boundary condition is that at uh, um, what's my other boundary condition? Okay, um, and then the last thing is, is the following, which is that, um, you know, I start with my concentration is initially equal to 1, so this is C as a function of radial distance, and so we're going to some steady state solution. So this will be C infinity, which asymptotically is decaying like, uh, you, know, you know, 1 minus 1 over R to the D minus 2. But we know that at infinite distance, it's got to go to 1. So the other boundary condition is that at C at infinity is equal to 1. And so that tells me that B is equal to minus A to the power D minus 2 power. And so from this, we're going to get that C of R is equal to 1 minus A over R to the D minus 2 power. So that's my solution for the uh, concentration field which means that the correlation function g of r in higher dimension is 1 minus this. So this is a over r to the power d minus 2 power. So this, what does this tell us? It says that for the, if we had voters that are living on a lattice of bigger than two dimensions, and I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a Trump voter, and let me look a distance of 100 miles away. What is the probability that, you know, a voter 100 miles away is a Trump voter? That's what this is telling me, and the probability is decaying like 1 over distance to the 1 power in three dimensions. And uh, it's saying that, uh, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning that a system necessarily reaches consensus. There's a little codicil here. It's a finite system necessarily reaches consensus. In the infinite system for the voter model, there is a steady state correlation profile that's set up, which decays like 1 over r to the d minus 2 power. So it's long-range correlation with the power law decay. Okay, so that's the, one di the three dimensional case. Let me now solve the same problem in one dimension. And again, here's where I needed more blackboard space because I, I hate to erase, but I'm gonna have to do it. So, well actually we've already solved the one dimensional case because that's what I spent, you know, that's what I solved um, that error function solution that I discussed previously, that's what we're solving. In fact, the one-dimensional voter model and the one-dimensional Ising model are the same thing. But I want to solve it a different way because the problem is that when you're dealing with problems uh, with correlation spreading in the system, so again, let's just look at this sort of just holistically. Here is my concentration profile. We saw that this concentration profile you know, there's sort of like, it's an error function profile, so there's sort of a characteristic range which grows like the square root of t, and this is growing, 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 growing. And you can think of this as that there is a moving boundary. You know, here c is equal to 1, here c is much, much less than 1, and there's a boundary point which is moving like square root of t where we change from c close to 1 to c much, much less than 1. And it turns out there's something known as the quasi-static approximation. So it's almost a self contradictory statement, quasi-static, because static means static, but quasi-static means, well, sort of not static. And when you have slowly moving boundaries, it turns out that the quasi-static approximation allows you to solve incredibly complicated problems with very simple methods. And to give you a feeling for what you can solve is like, when I was first a graduate student, I was presented with the following problem. In fact, you know, we had this sort of, I, I don't know what you call it, a general exam, you know, to see if you're competent. And I really love this problem. It was you have, and maybe in Italy you don't have so much uh, experience with this, but you have a cold lake. It's winter time. Ice starts free forming on the lake. How quickly does the thickness of ice grow as a function of time? And so the thickness is growing very slowly. And it turns out if you want to solve the problem exactly, it's an example of what's called a Stefan problem, a moving boundary value problem. But if you use the quasi-static approximation, you can solve it in two lines and you get the answer. So I'm not going to tell you what the answer is because, you know, maybe you want to tell me what you think the answer is, but you can ask how quickly, if, if the ambient temperature is below zero degrees Celsius, the water by definition is a huge reservoir that stays 
above, uh, you know, stays, stays at zero Celsius. So there's a thick, you know, there's a layer of ice that's growing. How thick does the layer grow? But it turns out that what I'm going to show you here essentially solves that same problem. So um, D equals one solution. We know the exact solution, but let me do the same thing by the quasi-static approximation. And part of the reason I'm doing this is that the same approximation I can apply in two dimensions. And in two dimensions, you'll see that the solution is very elementary, whereas if you try and do it exactly, you run into horrible Bessel functions, and you, know, you have to look up in Abramowitz and Stegen, and it's very easy to get lost. But with the quasi-static approximation, one can do it without any fancy mathematics. So the quasi-static approximation consists of the following thing, which is I'm going to solve CT is equal to the Laplacian of C. So I'm solving the same problem. I have C of 0T is equal to 0. That's the boundary condition for D equals 1. Um, but I have a second boundary condition, which is that C at square root of DT, T, is equal to 1. So I'm kind of assuming that, um, you know, this is a slowly moving boundary. It's moving at a rate square root of t. So diffusion ha can, like, mix up things in a range of root t, but outside of root t, diffusion hasn't had a chance to act. And so the concentration should just be that of the initial concentration. So I'm replacing this true thing by a picture like this, that there is a second boundary at a distance root dt, and it's moving, you know, to the right. And here we have c equals 1. Here we have something that we're going to compute using the quasi-static approximation. And so the third part of the quasi-static approximation is that we now forget about the time derivative. And so we replace the time derivative by a moving boundary. And because it's a one-dimensional problem, this problem is extremely simple because we know that to solve the Laplace equation, that's a second derivative equals zero. So that means the first derivative is, is a constant, which means that the zeroth derivative, or the function itself, is a linear function. That linear function has to be zero here. It has to be one here. So I can just write down the solution. Cxt is equal to x over the square root of dt. Oh. Uh, I notice that I see the, the, the letter big D here, because I'm always so used to writing the diffusion equation, where there's a diffusion coefficient out in front. But I don't have a diffusion coefficient, so let's get rid of it. So there's just t here. Sorry. So this is x over root t. And, you know, this is the asymptotic form of the error function solution that I had derived um, already before. But now we come to the more interesting case, which is what happens in two dimensions. So let's solve it in two dimensions. So the first point is that I want to solve, again, here is now radial coordinate, here is C of R. And now I'm going to put like a little a here. I need a little a. And now let me spend a few minutes discussing why I need this little a, because it's important. So um, it turns out that in the theory of diffusion or random walks, there is a phase transition as a function of the spatial dimension in the character of the random walk. A random walk in two dimensions and below is what's called recurrent, which means that it visits every single site infinitely often. Above two dimensions, it's transient, and it may not visit every single site of the lattice. And so you might remember that on the very first lecture, I mentioned very briefly about the first passage properties of a 1D random walk and the fact that a random walk is certain to return to the origin, but it takes an infinite amount of time to do so. And now I want to ask, what is the same question, or what is the answer to that same question in general spatial dimension? And so this is a bit of an interlude here. So recurrence versus transience. So let's imagine a random walk in arbitrary spatial dimension. So it's making some kind of a trajectory, whatever it is. So it, end, it starts here. It ends over here. And so what it does as it's making its trajectory is that it's exploring an exploration sphere whose characteristic size is the square root of dt, where d is a diffusion coefficient. And now I can ask, well, how many sites did I visit in a time t? So number of sites visited. 
or volume visited. So if I think of uh, like a discrete random walk, I can talk about number of sites visited. If I think of my random walk as a little particle of a finite size, it sweeps out some volume or I can compute the volume visited. But the number of sites visited, well, it's going for a time t, so clearly it visits t sites. And then the density of sites visited, So that's T divided by the volume, but the radius of the sphere is square root of T, and so the volume is, is the radius to the power D, and so that's T to the power D over 2. So this scales like T to the power 1 minus D over 2. And this function has different answers depending on the spatial dimension. So this is infinity in the long time limit for, for D equals 1. It's equal to 0 for D larger than 2. And in, one, in two dimensions, well, it, it's kind of uh, ambiguous what's going on here. And it turns out one has to be careful at the critical dimension. And it turns out there's a logarithmic term here. So this thing is still infinity, but only logarithmically infinity, infinite in d equals 2. And what this tells me then is that every single side is visited infinitely often in one dimension and two dimensions, which means that the random walk is what's called recurrent. It recurs, it comes back to every single site infinitely often. Whereas in three dimensions, the chance of, of hitting every site is, is zero, which means that there's a finite chance that you won't visit a site. So a more pictorial way of thinking about this is that if you send your kids, you know, like for you kids here that are watching this thing, this might not resonate with you yet, but you know, when my kids were like 20 years old, they went out into the world. And was I ever gonna see them again? Well, if they were doing random walks in one and two dimensions, I could be sure that I'd see them again. It might take forever for them to, to come back to me, but I would see them again. But if they were doing a random walk in three dimensions, there's a finite chance I'll never see them again. But this difference between high dimension and low dimension is what drives many beautiful properties of random walks. But now coming back to our problem of the voter model, here we were solving the concentration of the voter model uh, with a cliff at the origin. And the point was that we were always going to hit the cliff and, um, uh, you know, the, the, and that meant that the concentration field is always changing with time. And so there was a continuously varying uh, concentration field. In three dimensions, I said we went to a steady state. And that steady state arose because there's a finite chance that you never come back to, like, uh, the origin. And um, because you, there's a finite chance you never come back, that fraction is essentially giving rise to the steady state density profile. In two dimensions, we are sure to return because of the second line here. And so there'll be a, a time, you know, there'll be a continuously varying uh, concentration field, which corresponds to a coarsening process uh, or, or like a spread of correlations in, in the two dimensional voter model. And that's what I'm going to turn to next. And then there's only one more thing, which is that uh, one has to be careful of, which is that even though a random walk will visit every site infinitely often in a two-dimensional lattice, if you now go to the continuous limit, if you give your, uh, if your lattice sites are just point po points and you have a continuous diffusion field, the chance of re hitting a, a, a point of zero area is actually zero. So you need to give it a finite volume or a finite area, which can be arbitrarily small, but it has to be non-zero. And that's why we need a boundary condition at A rather than a boundary condition at zero. So once again, what I want to solve is uh, dCdt, or Ct is equal to uh, Laplacian of C in two dimensions, with C of A uh, t is equal to zero, and C of R t equals zero, is equal to 1. So this is a hard problem to solve. I mean, you know, again, um, you know, if you know your Bessel functions and all that, it's not so hard. So the solution involves Bessel functions. You've got to work a little bit, but you get the answer. But since I don't have my Brahmitz and Stegen right with me, and I forget, like, which Bessel function this is, I want to solve this with elementary methods. And so the, the elementary method, then, is that we're going to use the quasi-static approximation. So in the quasi-static approximation, I forget about this. And then I just say, well, somewhere out here at a, at a range of the order of root t, the diffusion field has, you know, like the fact that there's an absorbing boundary condition here can't propagate out further than root t. 
So out here, my concentration field is one. And inside of here, there is like some varying concentration field whose solution is given by the solution to the Laplace equation. So that's all I'm going to do. So now we want to solve, um, again, d, um, we want to solve uh, d second c by dr squared plus 1 over r dc by dr is equal to 0. So we want to solve this. And so, you know, again, we, we, it's, it's an equidimensional equation because the same powers of r on both sides here, so the solution is typically a power law. But when you then write down the initial equation, there's two indices, there's alpha equals 0 and alpha equals d minus 2. But in two dimensions, that's also the same as 0. So we have a um, degeneracy here. And what's known, again, you know, if you've, if you've taken a course in differential equations, this is, <coughs> this is all very standard stuff, but if you haven't taken it for 20 years, you've forgotten this all. But when the two indices are equal, that means that the solution is the form C of R is equal to A plus B log R. So in some sense, log R is like in the, um, R, um, exponent equals zero. And so if you had, you know, triple in, uh, degeneracy, you know, threes, uh, Three I mean, if you had like a cubic equation for the initial equation and you had three solutions that are zero, then it would be A plus B log R plus C log R squared. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that is our, our solution. And then we just have to um, impose the various boundary conditions. So we know that uh, C of A is equal to zero. So that gives me that um, A plus b log a is equal to 0. And we also have the other boundary condition that c at square root of, d, square root of t um, um, is equal to 1. <clears throat> so we're going to get, um, uh, you know, a plus b log square root of t is equal to 1. So there's two equations, two unknowns here to solve. And please allow me, because this is the place I really suck at, um, let me just not do this on the blackboard. Let me just write down the answer. So C is equal to logarithm of R over A divided by the logarithm of square root of T over A. And so you see that when R is equal to A, I have log of 1, so that's 0. And when r is equal to root t, then I have the same thing above, and so it's equal to 1. So that's what this uh, profile looks like. So we have a steady state profile, um, which, uh, you know, has this logarithmic uh, character to it. So now we're in a position to, like, come back to the voter model and get some insight into the process. So, you know, summary. If I'm looking at the, the correlation function, g of r, and it might depend on time. So this has three different behaviors depending on whether you're living in one dimension, two dimensions, or higher dimensions. So in one dimension, this is going like um, uh, 1 minus uh, 1 over square root of t. So I'm only, I'm only kind of writing the leading asymptotic behavior. Um, in two dimensions, it's going like 1 minus... Um, you know, log r over log t. And in three dimensions, it's going like um, r over a to the power, uh, whoops, other way around, a over r to the d minus 2 power. So both in the case of one dimensions and two dimensions, uh, correlation is spreading out. So as, as uh, oh, by the way, I'm sorry, this is r over t not 1 over t, r over root t. So it's saying that as time goes on, things get better and better correlated in both one dimension and two dimensions. And this is for d larger than 2. Whereas above two dimensions, you, you settle into like a steady state correlation profile that decays as a power law and distance. Um, so it actually suggests that if you deal with a finite system, that the approach to consensus is very different above two dimensions compared to one dimension. Because in one and two dimensions, the system basically coarsens. And the movie that I showed this morning of the coarsening of the one two-dimensional Ising model, you could do the same movie for just the uh, voter model in both one and two dimensions. 
Well, the voter model in one dimension is the same as the one dimensional Ising model, so there's nothing to discuss there. In the case of the two dimensional voter model, it has a, same, a similar kind of coursing profile, except that because the rule of the dynamical rule is proportional rule versus majority rule, it turns out that there's no surface tension associated with the interface. So the interface remains very rough, but still there's a coarsening that you can see that goes like the square root of t. But then in three dimensions, one settles into a steady state correlation profile and one needs an exponentially rare fluctuation to allow the system to reach consensus. Okay, so um, that's uh, four o'clock. Yeah, okay. So actually, I have two more things to say about the voter model, but I, I don't think I can talk anymore. I'm, I'm kind of tired, so I'd like to stop, and I'll just, I'll pick this up last, next time, and uh, by next time, I'll finish the discussion of spin dynamics. Sorry, I have a small question, if you have a yeah. minute. By the way, whenever you ask a question, please, I'm begging you, don't start with sorry, because you're, you know, you shouldn't be sorry. You should be happy to be asking a question. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's about the, the, mag the magnetization. So we, uh, if I remember well, but maybe I, I missed something, we said that the magnetization um, uh, in the voter model was, uh, the derivative was zero of the magnetization. Yeah, the time derivative of the magnetization is zero. Yeah, exactly. The mag magnetization is conserved, right. Yes. So it, it, it seems strange to me that uh, we say that we reach consensus, but the magnetization doesn't change? Yeah, so, okay, uh, a very good question, and I guess I have a couple of answers to that. <clears throat> First point is that it is a fact that the magnetization is conserved, and one way you can see that without any equation is that if you pick two misaligned spins, then the down guy could go up, but equally likely the up guy could go down. So if you average over those two events, the average magnetization does not change. So if you begin a system with zero magnetization is equally likely to end up with all spins plus or all spins minus. But you will reach consensus, but the point now is that you have a non-trivial non question of like what is the probability of reaching each type of consensus. So if the initial magnetization is zero, the final magnetization is zero, which means that equally likely you'll end up with plus or minus consensus. If the uh, initial fraction of up spins was three quarters, for example, then three quarters of the time you'd reach plus consensus and one quarter of the time you'd reach, reach minus consensus and that would also give you the same initial and final magnetizations. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yes, yes. Because okay. that was, uh, yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Okay, thanks. very good. Any other question? So... I one myself, but probably it's one of the two things you are going to discuss. Okay. Because you can solve the voter model also in, uh, uh, in the mean field, right? Yes. And there you see that uh, you reach consensus. Right. And uh, so this has to do with the fact that uh, here you are taking a limit where the size of the system goes to infinity before well, the, the thing time is that, uh, goes to infinity or? Well, I mean, the thing is that the complete graph voter model is also very easily solved because like there's no, there's no ge geometry. So in some, some sense, looking at one side of the system is enough to determine everything. But a pathology about the complete graph is that the coordination number of the graph is equal to the size of the graph. Normally for like a lattice graph in D dimensions, you know, the coordination number is like, you know, a it's like, a f you know, it's a finite number. And so if I'm looking at the ratio of the coordination number to the number of spins in the lattice, it's going to zero, whereas for the complete graph, these two things are same order of magnitude. But uh, again, um, yeah, because, uh, you know, the only variable in the complete graph is just the number of spins pointing up. I mean, you don't, there's no space anymore. It reduces to an effective one-dimensional problem. And so yeah. one can write down one-dimensional rate equations for the probability that you reach plus consensus or minus consensus or how long it takes to reach consensus. But in general, I think uh, you can uh, prove that uh, on a finite graph, the magnetization is a martingale, right? Exactly. That's the, that's, that's, yeah, that's so the other thing you are going to say tomorrow. Okay, I'll say it tomorrow. <laughs> no, I mean, it's one of the two things you were going to say. Uh, I was, uh, actually, I was, I was going to say that, but I mean, since you mentioned it, I'll, I'll mention that because it's, okay. it's so simple and so beautiful. Yeah, okay, I'll mention that next tomorrow. <laughs>
So for those of you who don't know what a martingale is, you'll know by tomorrow. Other questions? So if not, uh, we thank uh, Sid uh, again and uh, see you tomorrow at uh, 9 a.m. Or not see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. <laughs>